Welcome to this episode of One Book at a Time, the Manchester University Press podcast. Time to slow down, consider the issues, learn the histories and exercise your brain in the open air of considered judgment and frontline thinking and help us change the world one book at a time. Photographs of war and violence are inescapable in modern media. They are so ubiquitous that most of the time we take them for granted. Yet the right photograph at the right time still has the capacity to shock and to move us. In his book, The Violence of Colonial Photography, historian Daniel Folliard uncovers the early years of conflict photography from 1890 up to the outbreak of the First World War. He focuses on how the still new technology of the camera was deployed by the British and French authorities across a range of colonial settings, and in doing so, he tells two connected stories. First is about the development of conflict photography itself, its rules, its grammar. The second is about propaganda and power, because a camera, as much as a gun, can be a devastating weapon. Daniel was interviewed by Kim Wagner, Professor of Global and Imperial History at Queen Mary, University of London. He began by asking Daniel to describe the image used for the cover of the book. So it is an albumin print from a colonial negative, which was a technique that was widely used in the late 19th century. And this image was probably shot with one of these uh, very sturdy cameras and fixed on tripods that many people think about when you, 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 you talk about 19th century photography. And I, I came across this, this photograph in a specialized library in Paris a, a while ago. And when looking at the picture at first, I, I couldn't quite understand what it represented. It's a very disorienting image. Um, it shows a young girl dressed in white with a very fashionable hat and she's sitting uh, with her legs crossed in the middle of a garden. And nothing in the image itself allows the spectator to locate the image precisely. It could very well be in France uh, if you're not an expert at uh, identifying trees. And then one starts to experience a sort of cognitive dissonance when you look closer at the picture because the young girl holds a skull that has been placed in her lap and she's surrounded by another 12 skulls. And the picture is so disturbing, it's so very difficult to make any sense of it from the start, that when the book was released uh, two years ago in France, some people told me that they actually thought it was art, it was a made-up image for the cover. The photographer is uh, a woman named René Bonta. She um, traveled with her husband, Paul Bonta. He was a colonial administrators in the French Sudan, which is approximately uh, Mali uh, today, in the early 1890s. And she's probably the first woman to photograph things in the area. And the fact that she's a woman in a book that is mostly about white men wielding cameras is even more disorienting. The young girl in the picture is her daughter, Renée. She's probably 12 at the time. Everybody understands that the visual contents of the image tell a very grim story. But it's hard to make sense of it in detail without the caption that is written on the back of the picture. And it reads, René Bontemps playing with the skulls of Samoris Sofas, they were the Samoris professional soldiers, shot in the Outre Niger region after some pointless battles for the greater glory and profit of the marine artillery. Now we have some context, because after all, the caption is often the most important thing in an image. The French were actually fighting a very bloody war against Samori Touri at, at the time. He was an African leader resisting French expansion in the area. And these are the skulls of his soldiers, uh, probably killed or executed after a battle by the French and their local auxiliaries. And I could not name any of the individuals whose remains are exhibited in the picture, unfortunately. The image is very bizarre in the sense that it mixes death and childhood and it's surrounded by war. And what we see is a sort of collision of ideas and context in, in a given image. What is clear is that Raymond and Paul were horrified by some of the violence practiced by the French army and the war of conquest. The caption is visibly echoing the outrage. But this 
outrage does not mean they were immune to horrible racism and spiteful vocals and embodies as, sh as shown by the desecration of the skulls that you can see uh, in these scenes. So from colonial warfare, anthropology, racialized violence is pretty much everywhere haunting this image on, on several levels. I, I chose it as the cover because I wanted it to open the book and to close the book because the, the conclusion is almost exclusively about this given photograph. And I wanted to, the book to become a, a sort of, you know, new caption to this photograph. And like many of the other photographs reproduced in the book, I only decided to include it because it has already been recirculated at a local level. It already had several afterlives, both in France and Mali and Senegal. Uh, it has been recirculated on social media and politicized again by individuals that, that can be considered as custodians of these legacies. So one of the things you do in your book is that you don't just use the images to illustrate a conventional story about British and French uh, imperialism and its violence, but you very much take the images as starting points to explore what the visual spectacles and its reproduction meant to colonizers and, and the photographers. So can you say a bit more about the the kind of research and approach one might take uh, in terms of recovering something of what it meant to the people who took the images, who posed for them, uh, and then later reproduced them in books, but also circulated them in as postcards and these kind of things. The book doesn't take photographs as just images, but there's a focus on the photographic act and event on, on the ground. There is something about the British and French ideas of photography in the 19th century that was deeply connected to national and imperial identities. Uh, if you think about it, photography was a re relatively new medium when European colonial expansion intensified. It became not only a way to document exploration and conquest, but also a sort of component of the domination that Europeans wanted to exert on the colonized. And the photographic act, for instance, taking portraits or recording landscapes or um, capturing the military campaigns I'm talking about in the book, it's not external to the process of colonization. It's not something that is just outside. It's, it's part and parcel of the process of being there and dominating these populations. The camera was often, with the gun, one of the first machines that could actually be on the ground as a sort of manifest of European technological superiority. And what strikes me when you think about the colonial archive, the photographic colonial archive, is how quickly colonial and military authorities involved in imperial expansion uh, quickly understood photography's potential, even if they often overestimated its capacities. In British India, for instance, photography was institutionalized very quickly. You had photographers that were embedded in the regiments fighting the walls on the northern frontier. There's a good example in, in the book of an amazing combat photograph from the mid-1860s where you can actually see, you know, the trajectory of a shell, imperial troops ready for the fight. It's a very pioneering photograph as far as war photography is concerned. And it, it illustrates this investment British India had in these new technologies. The same goes with the French, even if they were, you know, converted a bit belatedly to these technologies. But someone like Gallieni, for instance, who was the, the first governor of Madagascar in the 1890s, created this huge visual database of Madagascar, the faces of people, of leaders, landscape, places, as a sort of tool of governance to make sure they could control not only visually, but identify people, start mapping out the territory. You can see that the colonial terrain, there's an intimate relationship between this colonial expansion and the, the visual photographic record. And in PL exploration and conquest were also fields of experimentation in the sense that the, the most uh, robust cameras were built for these people. Lots of experiments were made towards portability and sturdiness. So as a consequence, many of the individuals and organizations that were involved in colonial expansion had a specific familiarity with photography as a mode of recording experiences at gathering data. 
I give an example uh, of a French officer called Edgar Humbert. He was, you know, a mid-ranking officer from the French army. He spent huge amounts of money to create a very, very large collection of photos. He took more than 10,000 negatives in, in the course of 10 years while on missions in Indochina and Madagascar. And he's not an exception. You can see this obsessive investment in photography amongst many of the people involved in the conquest. I think photography provided a sort of visual glue to an ever-expanding imperial structure. It, it helped keep the sense of coherence, if you want. Postcards, albums, these very large official repositories of anthropological portraits, they all, I think, gave a sense of consistency in the midst of a very messy colonial expansion. As a consequence, photography became a key medium to propagandize colonialism and its victories. Colonial terrains were key sites to try and combine uh, military domination with photographic subjugation. Part of the visual repertoire included graphic views of execution, post-battle scenes in Africa and Asia, and the open circulation of very gruesome images on postcard and newspapers at the turn of the 20th century gives us a clear indication as to the um, intensity of colonial violence. I analyzed at length one very striking photograph that was published on the cover of L'Illustration, which is the equivalent of the Illustrated London News, and it shows the decapitated head of Rabi as Zubair on a stake, on a spike, sorry. Rabi was a slave trader and the Sultan of Borno near Lake Chad. He was eventually defeated by the French and his corpse was desecrated in a very spectacular way after the battle. A photograph was taken, developed on the site, showed to local population, and then the negative was sent to Paris for publication. And that very violent repertoire was often in the open, but part of it was also limited to a very small circulation. I analyzed several images made for a very limited number of people, networks of veterans, local colonial communities, where the sensitivity thresholds, if you want, were very, very different. Such images are obviously not kept in museums or national archives because they have been filtered out more often than not, unless the descendants have given a sort of untouched collection. It's the point of the book. These are some of the very few direct traces of the atrocities committed by the French during the conquest of Madagascar and Indochina. There is a visual repertoire that is very much there once you start digging, but is very much not part of how we might view European Western imperialism today, right? So we have, on the one hand, a complex you know, body of visual evidence. And at the same time, we have fairly uh, nostalgic narratives that are quite pervasive, even in the 21st century. How can one maintain uh, exceptionalist narratives of Western imperialism while at the same time have images such as the one that's on the cover of your book? What the book demonstrates is it's hugely important to move beyond national frames to study these processes and histories. And the point here is narrow enough to show that people, images and practices circulated a lot internationally and even globally. If you think about the Battle of Omdurman, which was a massive British victory, few people know that he was photographed by an Italian military attaché. Uh, he was on the ground with one of these foldable cameras, he wrote a full report to the, the Italian government accompanying it with pictures because the Italians had been defeated in Ethiopia two years before and wanted to know how to fight a colonial battle very effectively. The same thing goes with the French. I show in the book that the French were often very worried about the first photographic scandals that the British faced and learned some lessons about it. We can even move beyond, you know, the British, French, imperial exceptional narratives. I show some examples in the book of Ottoman pictures that were created to counter attack some visual narratives created by the West, criticizing Ottoman violence in the 1870s. Another example could be the Japanese. The first military photographic section was created by them. So given that this kind of evidence exists, it's really hard to not look at these empires as things that you want to compare and analyze together. 
you talked about the violence around 1900. We are talking about this sort of age of, of, of high imperialism. And reading your book, I couldn't help but sort of wonder, how did we come to uh, have an understanding of war correspondence and wartime photography that almost completely ignores exactly the kind of images and practices that your book discuss. Mm. Uh, and there's this sort of fairly neat narrative about how the first photographs of battlefields, they come out of the Crimean War, the Indian uprising, and the, especially the American Civil War, and then a skip and a jump, and uh, we're in the First World War. And you kind of, without ever saying so, present a completely different uh, history of war photography. Um, so can you say a bit about what kind of intervention or what kind of novel perspective you present, which really does challenge and transform the chronology that's uh, usually associated with the history of photography and conflicts? Two chapters of the book are actually a sort of chronological background to establish why the cameras were on site during these um, wars of colonial expansion. There's a history of, of the history of war photography. And the first books talking about the history of war photography were written in the US in the early 20th century. So the first milestones, if you want, of that history were already established at a very early stage. The first attempts at writing the history of war photography are very US-centric as a consequence. And I believe the structuring of the research on the long term in the late 20th century, early 20th century, has also been very US-centric in the sense a lot of money to digitize uh, funds, a lot of money to fund visual studies projects have been developed in the English-speaking world. So there's some of the funds, photographic funds elsewhere have been kind of overlooked as being not as important in terms of writing this history. It was a bit frustrating for me because in the course of researching the book, I found a lot of evidence of very early war photography in Brazil, for instance, in the late 1860s. You've got examples of war photography in Japan in the late 1860s as well. Russia, uh, the Ottoman Empire, there's a sort of photographic section established by the Ottoman Empire during the Greek-Turkish War in the late 1890s, amazingly enough. So it's a much more multinational history, I think, that should be uh, written. But there's also more deeply, I think, a tendency that dates back to the, the early 20th century to consider that these late 19th century conflict outside of Europe were somewhat less important or less significant than the battlefields of Europe and the US. There's a visual re repertoire of war today in Europe and the US that has a lot to do with Western battlefields and very rarely with wars of colonization. I'm working on a new project now, digitizing a lot of photographs so that people can access them freely on early conflict photography. I'm amazed at how little we know of the African campaigns during the First World War, for instance. There's a lot of images and nobody knows about them. What I, I think I demonstrate in the book is that the idea of capturing combat, extreme violence, was always there on the horizon. It's a very common process in the history of photography. And I show several examples of amazing photographs taken with cameras that were not supposed to do that. Photographers taking the technology to its very limits to capture something they wanted to do. And one of the consequences of that socio-cultural process within photography is that it's very often a history from the bottom to the top rather than from the top to the bottom. My point is, we've often written the histories of war photography, looking at these superheroes, war photographer, and we forget that a lot of the aesthetics, the visual repertoire was built by sometimes very ordinary soldiers, doctors, people that were with a camera on the ground. I show several examples in Africa. Uh, the first portrait of Samoy Touré when he was captured were taken by, you know, very ordinary soldiers that immediately thought it would be a good idea to s capture the captured uh, and sell the photograph to French newspapers. And my assumption is that war correspondents imitated 
what these amateur photographer would do rather than the opposite. So what you have is a mass of very vulgar, ordinary images progressively influencing this new visual repertoire of war photography. The corporation of war photographer is established in the 1900s, basically. And they are all in touch with these soldiers and veterans. And there's a, a huge sense of porosity between these different circles. And I think we forget that because we write the history of photography is based on these great names and heroes of the field. And I hope that's something the book demonstrated that we should look at, you know, the amateur, massive, anonymous people participating in the, the building up of these visual representations. And I think in your work, you kind of show how difficult it is to separate the perpetrator from the photographer or vice versa. And I was just wondering if you could say a bit more about that, about what does the presence of a camera do to situations where extreme violence take place? There are several examples in the book of moments of absolute humiliation created by colonizers. I study in detail the Denshui executions that have been photographed, and it's clear that the camera is absolutely a full component of the humiliation. People knowing very well that the, the presence of the camera would add to the pain and the humiliation at the time. And the same goes with this very large gallery of portraits of exiled kings and monarchs. The colonial operators understood that very well. I think more than that, they anticipated what would be done with these photographs on the very long term. If you think about Galliani, I talked about him uh, earlier, or Lyoté. Lyoté was the great architect of French colonialism. They were absolutely clear with the idea that they were building an archive, a visual archive, that would disrupt the narrative, the recording of the histories of the people that were colonized. They wanted to create this sort of visual disruption most of them gave their photographs or their descendants uh, donated the photographs and their albums to national archives, knowing that the history of colonization would be written with these images. If you think about Curzon, you get tens and tens of albums that, that were framing basically visually uh, what British colonization meant to India. And the book is very much about finding these images that would destabilize, that would derail the narrative that they wanted to create. It works on both levels. It's the first a sort of extra lethal kind of tool. And then the visual records are anticipated as potential basis for the writing of the history 30, 40, 50 years later. All these people were living in a time where museums, archives were starting to be organized and institutionalized. They knew very well that whatever they would leave would influence greatly the writing of uh, history on the long term. So the book is very much about trying, you know, to counter this archive. So one of the, I guess, the elephant in the room is a very simple question in a sense. How do we work with these kind of absolutely horrific images without simply replicating the colonial gaze. I know there's been similar debates in the context of dissemination of, of, of you know, lyn lynching photography in the US, which are quite often exhibited. But, but how have you, in, in your book, approached this really central issue? It's very repulsive material. Um, it, it was always a dilemma in the sense that I'm a human being. I know you work on atrocity photograph as well, and I, I had many sleepless nights because of this, my positionality as a French researcher working on colonial pasts. Maybe strangely enough, my initial fear was to, to become a gatekeeper. I found some extremely disturbing material that I chose not to include in the book. And I still worry about this. The argument could be that I'm, you know, who am I not to show this? This proves evidence of crimes. Sometimes these photographs are the very last trace of crimes that were committed in the late 19th century, early 20th century. There's no written records. I can think of a very gruesome photograph in one archive. It's actually the last 
the only trace of what happened. So I talked with colleagues in Africa, Asia, colleagues in France, the US, the UK. The criteria for me to reproduce the pictures was that they had to be circulated again, in the sense that I, I used pictures that had already been recirculated, researched or reappropriated locally most of the time. And in the absence of a recent recirculation, I've sent countless messages and emails to try and contact colleagues and local authorities to consult with them whenever I could. And I've been very lucky with some of, of these images. I got in touch with great people that could completely transform the reading of the images. I think in particular of the, um, the experts at the Amagugu International Heritage Center and, and Patti Saniathi in particular, he, he shared his knowledge with me on a given photograph of Long Api. And it, it's, it provides a completely different light. And he encouraged me to work on this, by the way. We work with Nancy Rushora, uh, for instance, from Dar, Dar es Salaam University. She's invested in, you know, exhuming these photographs as well. So that was the, the ethical approach to this. This being said, there is a very powerful argument not to show images that substantiate very extreme oppression and, and physical violation. It can literally affect the reader. It, it brings emotions to the front that can be uncontrollable, specifically if you're a descendant of the people that are shown in the image. People like Susan Crane or Ariela Azoulay have been writing about the importance of suspending research or not showing these photographs uh, anymore. So I had to confront these two main issues, basically. The ethics of reproducing these violent images and my position as a historian working from France on these images. As far as the first issue is concerned, there's something that I think should be questioned. It's the idea of the immediacy of photographs, in the sense that many people will automatically think that visual violence excites feelings and creates something particular and that these feelings are going to become obstacles to a sort of acknowledgement and fruitful engagement with these photographs. And the book is also about the history of these ideas. There's a genealogy to these ideas in the sense that this kind of anxiety is developed in the 19th century where many people started to fear the development of a democratic society where people would start informing themselves and shape their own lives and experiences. And then came the, the very latest idea that information overload, lack of refinement in documentary visual representation would excite emotions and be dangerous and useless. And it's very connected to stereotypes on the working class, not being able to, you know, process information. I wrote the book and reproduced this, some of the material with that emancipated spectator in mind. I don't think it's for me to decide whether one should see these images or not. Uh, you can not read the book. It's, it's a pretty easy gesture. There is enough data on the cover and back of the book for anyone to make an informed decision. I'm not the guardian of a sort of sacred temple. And specifically, I'm not a formalist. I don't believe in sort of formalist take on photography. Photography doesn't convey more of the real violence than written or oral accounts. And I feel it does, like everybody, because I'm born in this society where images are so powerful and are part of the, the discourse. But the notion that they are distinctly powerful is a cultural construction on Mary le level. It's very Euro-American centric. If you think about Kodak advertising its cameras in the 1900s to photograph war, it's exactly that kind of argument that is being made. I won't dwell on how often I've read slightly paternalizing assumption on how spectators from the global south might be more prone to extreme emotions when looking at photographs of violent uh, colonial pasts. But to a certain extent, it echoes with discourses I can read in late 19th century and early 20th century theories and photography. As far as the replication of the gaze, it's a dilemma again. I mean, I'm, you're, you cannot avoid being ambivalent about this. So you've got the choice of showing. And yes, there's a sense that you're going to replicate the perpetrator's gaze. But not showing is also a form of replication of the perpetrator's gaze, in the sense that many of the photographs and events described in the book 
were hidden from sight or forgotten on the long term because people didn't want to talk about it. I'm very ambivalent as to the idea of occulting these images and hiding them from sight, even if I understand absolutely. It's, I guess, very different takes on this photograph are necessary. I think it's, it's not my book against other visions, but a variety of perspectives on these images that, that are needed today. Since you've already talked about what kind of intervention your book does in terms of, of the history of photography, but also the history of the reception of, of images. And you just said that in some ways, you know, photographs are not different from the written word, right? So what uh, would you like readers to take away in terms of the way we think about Western imperialism? How does your book putting photography uh, and images of violence at, at the front and center of the analysis. What does that do to our understanding of Western occupation uh, and violence in the non-Western world a century and a bit ago? There's the different dimensions to, uh, to the effect it has. And that's what the, the perpetrators wanted to a certain extent. The first impression you get out of this picture is subjugation, humiliation, uh, destruction. And the book is very much about defeating this by careful research. It's about, you know, drowning these images in words to try and defeat the malignant power, if you want. We historians have a responsibility to desanctify this colonial violence to a certain extent. The, the power of, it, of these images was something that the colonial oppressors wanted to produce. The idea is to find ways, slowly, carefully, to neutralize this, to try and stop the power that the perpetrators wanted to create by words and to try and rebalance the visual with textual information and research. The other potential problem with this is a lot of people, I think, didn't expect these images to even exist. You don't think about campaigns in Africa or Asia in the 1890s being that documented that closely. And I'm trying to warn the reader that these images shouldn't be hiding the other forms of violence that were central to imperial expansion. We live in a very image-based society where the images are exhuming can have more power because of the culture we live in. But it's very important to understand that I don't talk about sexual violence, for instance, slow violence of the destruction of the environment, more ordinary forms of violence. So it's very important to understand these are very fragmentary point of entries into this. Lots of colonial campaigns, lots of events that are, have been very violent are not documented in photographs as well. These photographs are interesting because they often testify to peaks in violence where people felt so confident in what they were doing that they would even take pictures. So we need to take them as they are. Very lacunary, very interesting, very revealing, but at the same time obscuring things as well and potentially giving a sort of partial analysis of the situation. So really the book is about trying to harness emotions and not refusing them, but you know, keep their power to a certain extent to try and engage with these photographs. And the last thing I, I believe, I, I hope, one can take from the book is we're not prisoners. Nobody's a prisoner of this victimizing photographs. They are victimizing. There's no doubt about this. But as I show in the book, there has been many reappropriations on the ground in Africa, in Asia of these photographs already. Historical research is just one of the dimensions, one of the perspectives to try and not consider the people in these images and their relatives are just pure victims. They never were. I talked in the book about how gaze uh, was given back to the camera, how these pictures often circulated right away. Take the Den Show executions. They immediately became icons of Egyptian nationalism. I talk about a very gruesome set of images from a massacre in Bakel 
in the early 1890s, and it triggered one of the you know largest outrage in France, la largest debates on whether colonialism was a good idea or not. It didn't work, but none of these images is fixed in pure relation of power. Okay, and I hope the book is trying to destabilize the subjugation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Manchester University Press podcast, One Book at a Time. If you like what you've heard, please check out the MUP website, www.manchesteruniversitypress.co.uk, where you can find and order a copy of this book and many others like it. Don't forget to follow us on all major social media platforms and subscribe to our newsletter for 30% off all our books.